Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We're excited to have over 350 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for one credit from the ACI. Let's get started by giving one lucky attendee a Webinar Wednesday t-shirt for answering this trivia question. September is National Potato Month. Which US state is the largest producer of potatoes? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to invite everyone to join us for our full MD Expo, which will be taking place at the Hilton Baltimore Inner Harbour next month, October the 17th to the 19th. We look forward to you joining us for three days of learning, networking, and the latest advances in medical technology, products, and services. Registration is open and more details can be found at mdexposhow.com. Okay, and let's see who our Webinar Wednesday t-shirt winner is, and it is Jake Narvi. Congratulations, Jake. The correct answer, of course, is Idaho. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Avante Health Solutions. Avante Health Solutions provides a single source solution for all your capital equipment needs from one powerful partner. They are a one-stop brand agnostic supplier of high quality, new and refurbished equipment at prices that stretch your dollar. With best in class service, parts and repair, the perfect health solution is just one click away. For more information, visit avantehs.com. Our presenter today is Eric Davis, Vice President of Operations Imaging at Avante Health Solutions. Eric, you may begin whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. Thank you, and I'm glad to be here and, and help out today. Uh, we've got a lot of slides to go through, but I hope that it'll be fun and interesting for you, so let's just jump in. Today, we're talking about the introduction to computed tomography. We'll talk about the history, first through fourth generation of the scanners, an overview of, the, uh, of what makes it all happen and the machine itself. We're also going to speak to the CT number adjustment and the Hounsfield numbers and why we need to worry about those. Uh, we're also going to see some examples of the different types of applications that we can uh, use clinically with uh, computed tomography and common problems and, and what it takes uh, money-wise to own a CT scanner. Uh, the history of the, the CT scanner uh, is where we'll start, the first to fourth generation. It was invented by Dr. Godfrey Hounsfield and James Ambrose, uh, they used it initially to diagnose a tumor way back in 1971. And I'm also going to do the cliche origin of the word because I think it'll help us remember a little bit. But tomos in Greek means slice or section, and graphia is writing. So it's a writing of a section of our anatomy. Uh, as you know, CT is a, a sectional uh, anatomy uh, where we will see some of those images as we move on. Uh, I've also got some cool pictures of the first CTs that uh, were out there. This is the um, the lathe prototype from that the, that uh, Godfrey and Ambrose had came up with, and one of the first images here. You can see that's a sectional image of a brain, and, and uh, you can see it's highly pixelated, differing greatly from the images that we see today on CT. Uh, another picture of uh, Dr. Hounsfield with uh, a very early scanner of CT, and it was head only. We can also see some of the images that this would produce, one of those pixelated images that we saw earlier. This is the first clinical, clinically used CT scanner uh, that was uh, for heads only as well. And you can notice uh, a lot of the computer racks here that are required to process the images a lot of computing power required in computed tomography. The first generation of, uh, the, of a CT scanner was a single source with a single detector. Uh, they sometimes call that step and shoot uh, or translate rotate. Uh, simple x-ray beam, similar to what you would find on an x-ray machine, just a sim simple pencil beam. And the x-ray source would shoot across the patient, through the patient into a single detector. Scan time was 25 to 30 minutes and limited to head scans, and we were looking at another 25 to 30 minutes, sometimes more, just for image processing. When we talk about step and shoot, that is where literally we would take a, create x-ray, shoot it through the patient onto the detector, and then move the patient table a slight step and take another exposure. Uh, 
this will become more apparent as we move on a little bit. But it's literally, you can see the x-ray source here to the detector, the lines representing the, the x-ray, the center, of course, being the patient or any type of an object. And this is how the original CT worked, shooting just x-ray through and, and, and being recorded on a single detector. The uh, rotation happens when you would shoot this way, rotate 90 degrees, and take another exposure to that way. In the second generation, we move to a fan-shaped beam and we get multiple detectors. You get about 30 detectors in a row, uh, which the, the, the fan beam could now cover. Scan time was reduced significantly uh, down to 90 seconds, not necessarily because of uh, a huge technological leap, but also of the of being able to do multiple detectors with a fan-shaped beam. But we've also seen a lot of increases in computing power capacity as well to cut that scan, scan time down. So where we can see here, we've still got our source. We're still doing a step and shoot where we, we or a, a, a translate rotate where we take the exposure of the patient. Uh, but now we have a fan-shaped beam, and now we have multiple detectors to record that X-ray. Everybody can see uh, my laser pointer here when I'm when I'm talking about the different parts of where you can see what we're talking about. So this allowed uh, the CT scanner to acquire more slices at uh, one time when taking the exposure. So the big improvement here is going from the pencil beam to the fan beam and getting it from a single detector to multiple detectors. The third generation, which surprisingly, we are going to talk about a fourth generation as well, but third generation is what we're going to see mostly in our hospitals now. Uh, it, it is the by far the most common scanner. I don't, I've never physically seen one of the early first generation or second generation scanners. So third generation is where we are now. Now we've gone to uh, uh, where we're going full rotate, rotate. So the x-ray source and the detector are spinning at the same time. This allows for spiral or helical scans, which some of the pictures will help uh, demonstrate a little bit better, but we're using a fan-shaped beam that is now spinning as the patient table is moving. Also reduced our scan time to uh, five seconds, which is fantastic, much lower radiation dose, much faster scan time. And again, now we can see the same, the same illustrations of the source and detector, but this is gonna be spinning around and around the entire time. Same demonstration here. So we have the multiple detectors and the fan-shaped beam, but it is gonna be spinning the entire time the, the exam is going on. The big step, of course, is going to be our sectional anatomy where we're taking our pictures that are all parallel and together, going into this helix, where we're the helix where we get the word helical, where we're doing a spiral right around the patient as the tube and the detector rotate the entire time. Interestingly enough, that the, the algorithms for calculating the data to produce images for spiral and helical scans were... Uh, available and patented long before the technology that was uh, able to do it. Uh, Slippering technology was the key in 1985 to making helical scans become a reality in clinical use. And again, this is another demonstration. I, I, I like to make sure that everybody can wrap their head around what this is with, a heel, with a, a acquiring the images in a helix. Here's our x-ray source here and then our, our uh, detector here. The Z-axis, this yellow line, is really gonna be where the patient would be located or the table. And this whole assembly is gonna spin around as the table moves in and out to get this helical-shaped uh, exposure. The row count and the uh, row count or slice count, uh, I use the terms interchangeably, but row count and slice count are the same. Uh, right now, we're 2 to 320 slices in the third generation scanners. Uh, they also do 640 on the latest Toshiba, but it's a little bit of a misnomer. They've just got a, uh, the ability to spin really, really quickly and acquire um, the uh, double the slices because they're rotating so quickly. 1998 was a big deal because that's when we got to a four-row uh, third generation scanner that was spinning where we could get 16 millimeters of coverage in a four by four 
exam, which is just a lot more volume uh, of image that you're getting from the x-ray than what we could do in the first and second generation. Scan time increases, the, the computer increases, the computer computing process computer processing power increased to allow for you know the faster scan times and we're getting a lot more options for scanning when we 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 uh, acquire isotropic vo voxels the 8 row was out in 2001 16 row in 2002 32 row in 2003 and this is really the early 2000s is when the CT manufacturers were um, the CT manufacturers were in a slice count war, literally between each other, where one would come out with uh, a higher slice count and somebody else would come out with another. Uh, 32 slice scanners are fairly rare. Um, GE came out with a 32 slice scanner as they were still preparing their 64 slice. And then of course, uh, uh, Siemens and Philips came out with a 40 slice scanner to kick it up a notch uh, just in this interim before in 2004, they had finally hit a 64 slice scanner, which is really 64 slice is going to be kind of our bread and butter scanner. I would imagine that that most of you in the facilities that you're working in uh, have uh, a 64 slice or higher. Uh, 16 slice scanners are still highly uh, practical and useful in clinical clinical use now, but 64 slice scanners added some uh, uh, some features like cardiac scanning and increased the acquisition time. Siemens Sensation 64 is the most common 64 slice scanner in the world. You can see a picture of it here. Um, of course, these uh, modern third generation scanners, as they, they got to the 16 slice, eight slice, even higher, uh, they had were able to uh, shed a lot of the problems of early scanners. Uh, these scanners have the ability to make an entire, a lot of x-ray without much cooling time. The, Sensation 64 is a liquid cooled system and quite literally can scan all day long as long as you can give it uh, cold water. Uh, the Germans engineered it to make a whole lot of x-ray without stopping for much of a break, quite a workhorse. GE had their VCT volumetric uh, computed tomography. Also one of the most common scanners out there in the world, I believe the GE scanner was most common in the US where the Siemens was most common worldwide. The big difference between these scanners is the GE is an air-cooled scanner, but still the, the heat capacity of both of these scanners allows for doing a lot of scans in a very short period of time. Uh, in the 128 row came out in 2005. Uh, with a Siemens definition dual source, technically a 64 by two. We've got a picture of this, and this is, I'll call out, I don't know if these guys are here, but these are some Avanti engineers, uh, Tyler Lindsay and Tyler Two. Um, this is a picture of the dual source, and it's kind of a neat scanner because it has two detectors and two x-ray tubes. So rather than being a true 128, it doubled the capacity made for a very deep, gantry so the distance from the front to the back is is a little bit further because it's it's using two 64 slice systems in there this illustration here shows kind of what the scanner does we've got an x-ray tube here and an x-ray tube here detector and detector uh, a very specialized scanner for cardiac scans uh, very quick they uh, can take pictures of the human heart beating because it goes uh, it, it's able to acquire so many slices at once at such a fast time. The 320 row was the Toshiba Quillian One. They seem to be the latest winners on the uh, the slice count right now. And their claim to fame with the 320 was the ability to take an image of our heart in one rotation of the X-ray tube and detector assembly. Uh, most other manufacturers have have made it out to 256 slice count, which would be the latest and greatest. Um, again, we talked about the 640 being kind of uh, silly, um, that it's just spinning extra fast. Uh, this Going back, the 64 slice, when you want to talk about how fast these scanners can rotate, um, possible is 0.1 second per rotation, and most of the cardiac scans on the 64 slices are going to be acquired at a third second rotation. So three complete, complete rotations 
uh, per second. Uh, and it's about 2,000 pounds of weight spinning around. CT is going to be very balanced because we're spinning that weight. Um, so balance is an issue we need to, to be concerned about. Um, but it is, it is pretty fascinating that we're getting high voltage to the x-ray tube and the detector as they spin. Here are some images of some slip rings. This is an older style where they are on the top here. So we've got basically just copper wire nailed flat. This is kind of how the prototype started, making contact with carbon brushes. Here are some of the carbon brushes, one style here, and here's the another style here where all of the, the voltage and the data is being transmitted through this carbon. This, these tips of these brushes, so the tips here and the tips here, make contact to the slip rings here and apply the power as it spins. And they are designed to wear out uh, because there's a friction between the ring and the brushes themselves. And that's something we'll talk a little bit when we get to the, the, the maintenance and cost of ownership section. But uh, very important to keep uh, your slip rings in good condition because as you can see, all of our data and all of our power is being transmitted through these rings themselves. Another image of a more modern slip ring, and this happens to be a slip ring manufactured by Schliefring out of Germany. And uh, most of the CT scanners are, are having Schliefring manufacture these. So they've shown these rings separated. They would be embedded into this uh, polycarbonate material here. And they're going around on this flat surface here, surface here. So kind of more of the, uh, the shape of the, the new modern Frisbees that have a hole in the middle. Uh, many of you also would probably ask, why aren't we using wireless data transmission since wireless data transmission has been, uh, you know, it's on our phones, it's at home and our Wi-Fi. They are doing that with the transmitters and receivers as well. Um, but we also want to make sure that we don't introduce any noise into the images as we're collecting the data from the x-ray. So all of the modern scanners are still using uh, power brushes and data brushes, and this would be an example of the brush block here. Over here, we, we're showing this outer ring here, which is actually on the tip here, and that's an encoder so that the computer knows exactly where the uh, uh, everything is in position as it spins around and around. The, the processing for the algorithms is acutely aware within uh, millimeters of where the x-ray tube and detector are located at any time. Three-dimensional imaging is something that's been uh, uh, produced when we've gone into the helical scans and with the, the newer uh, uh, processing algorithms where we can take our sectional images and make them into 3D images. Here's a picture of a skeleton from a CT, a compilation of several scans to demonstrate exactly what can be done with three-dimensional image reprocessing. So the scanner itself will produce the sectional images, just a slice of the anatomy where the algorithms and the computers can take that data and make 3D images like this later on. Another image of cardiac where we can see uh, blood vessel detail, again, a 3D reconstruction of a cardiac scan. So you can imagine clinically what a, what a huge help this is to healthcare providers, doctors, surgeons, you name it. Also, when we've gone in the third generation scanners, we have new scanning parameters that we hadn't considered before, one of them being pitch. And that pitch is really just the distance between the slices. So even though we're now acquiring in a helical scan this, this helix, the image processing algorithm still is producing an image that's just a straight up and down sectional anatomy. Um, if your pitch is one, the coils are touching less than one the coils are overlapping so you get a little oversample of data for increased image quality and of course uh, if your pitch is greater than one then you can see that the helix of acquisition is, is uh, spread out a little bit and this becomes more important when you're when you're doing the again the slices you know because of the shape of the ct scanner where the patient goes through the x-ray is always shooting ax axially so if the, if the computer is always taking images, the CT scanner is always taking images axially, how do you get coronal or sagittal? And that's all done through image processing. I know we can do a little bit of tilt to a CT gantry during acquisition, uh, but really the, uh, the coronal and sagittal slices are going to be coming through 
image reprocessing. And you have to remember that if there's data missing, as there would be between these helices, that the, the algorithm is designed to fill in that data by averaging out what it's getting where it does actually have x-ray data. So again, um, some of the more, more of the things that came with third, third generation that's been coming later on here uh, towards you know, the modern times uh, is digital enhancement, you know, reducing the radiation dose for the patient, reducing artifacts. Metal obviously does not allow x-ray to go through it very easily, so it can cause artifacts. Uh, MIP, that's multi-imaging, uh, multi-planar imaging where the um, we're, we're talking about being able to change our sectional anatomy from the helix that we've acquired. So 3D constructions, different fancy cone beam constructions where the, you know, we're able to reconstruct data differently with our fan beam x-ray getting wider as time goes on. Um, and of course, the cardiac scanning that we've talked about. This is a good example of sectional anatomy. Um, some of the, I like this because the, the areas are labeled. So this is the chest. We're taking, of course, an axial slice uh, of the anatomy here. You can see the lungs on either side, the heart in the middle, spinal cord, the vertebrae. You can see what bone looks like on CT scanners. But then we're also seeing some of the calcium that we're getting in the heart. So this is where a lot of the cardiac surgeons and uh, uh, Cardiologists love having uh, CT images done here. And of course, again, back to a 3D reconstruction. So this is where the computer processing becomes fancy is that we're taking these slices, you know, every millimeter or so across the body and then using the computer to translate the data that we've gathered in these slices into a three-dimensional image. CT has a definite advantage over other imaging uh, modalities such as MRI, because it, it does have the ability to see this lung tissue fairly well, where MRI, of course, you, you've got to have water in the tissue for MRI to see it. The fourth generation of uh, CTs, and I even wonder why we're, why we're talking about it, uh, they haven't made anything since about uh, 2006. Uh, the scan time was fairly decent, two to three seconds back then. Um, but everybody uh, who's ever taught a class on CT feels the need to mention it, and I didn't want to be left out. And this one, the detector is completely surrounding the object that you're scanning, and the source moves around and around. Uh, so you can see that again where the purple is our detector. So lots of detectors, a fan beam x-ray, but the tube moves around and the detector stays fixed. There are some advantages to uh, the detector getting a little better image quality in that manner, but for whatever reason, it wasn't developed by the CT manufacturers. They also have the ability of taking the X-ray and moving it external to the ring and shooting the X-ray in and bouncing it up into the detectors that would completely surround the patient. Uh, again, this uh, you know maybe something that comes out in the future, maybe new developments that come, but. Uh, not much on the horizon uh, with the fourth generation of CT scanners. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, now we'll move on to just a basic overview of uh, the physics and the technology required to acquire a CT. Uh, I've got this image here, and you can see, of course, the, the little fun fact. From 95 to 2007, the amount of CT scans in the United States has almost tripled and it continues to increase. Um, clinical use of the scanner is becoming a little bit less of a concern as the radiation dose has gone down as te detector technology has increased and computing technology has increased as well. So we don't need as much x-ray to get the quality of images that we've seen in the past. So these are where we are seeing the advancements in CT technology today versus just a simple increase in slice time. We're getting better detectors, less radiation dose to make that happen, and uh, faster scan times even more, and faster reprocessing times when we do some of the fancy reconstructions or, or multi-planar imaging. Um, as you know, radiation is uh, it's bad for the body. It's, uh, um, you know, radiation dose is something we should be concerned about. Um, XR29 was one of the, the FDA's mandates for uh, reporting the amount of radiation dose a patient receives each time they receive a, 
a CT scan, and uh, we want to make sure that we're not inducing more problems by the radiation dose. Um, but essentially, radiation, uh, the radiation dose from a, a CT, it's uh, more than background, it's more than a chest x-ray, and it's more than, you know, the the airport scanner that everybody uses for an example. But uh, the, the biggest concerns with radiation dose would be in the head scans where you're putting a lot of radiation into a smaller area or the age of the, age of the patient, um, neonatal uh, toddlers much more susceptible to uh, absorbing that radiation. So that's one of the issues that we worry about. But again, just a different way of showing all of the pieces together in our illustration here. Tube and the detector rotate. They produce this helical image that for to get the sectional, the, the sectional anatomy. And of course, a motorized table or patient table where it is moving in and out of the CT. Uh, as you can see here with the table going in and out of the center of the CT scanner to produce that those images. We need a couple things to make uh, the to make the uh, make x-ray possible. Uh, I've got an illustration here. So T is for the tube. X is for the x-ray where it shoots across in that fan beam side. D is the detector or DAS as it's sometimes referred to as the data acquisition system, and of course, R because it's all rotating. So the detector is really going from here to here. Crystals are located here, cooling fans to keep it all cool, and a lot of conversion cards to take that analog X-ray and turn it into a digital signal that the computer can deal with. X-ray tube, collimator, these are high voltage components here required to make the, the X-ray. And of course, even built-in cooling as well. The uh, sorry, this is not a high voltage. These are the high voltage components here. This here would be the heat exchanger to cool off the X-ray tube. This here is going to be some of these big lead weights just to balance the whole thing out as it spins. I've got a cool video of a scanner spinning, so you can get a feel for uh, just how quickly they can move. Another image to kind of give you a, a feel for everything. X-ray tube, you can see the cables here going to the high voltage components. Also the cooling tubes on this side to, to, for heat exchange and take the heat load off of the tube. And of course our, our DAS system here. To make X-ray, it's not really that different than anywhere else. I imagine uh, a lot of you have experience with the uh, you know, just general x-ray and, and fixing different things in hospitals, but it's the same same sort of thing. We need a generator or a transformer to make our high voltage, an x-ray tube, uh, the cathode, which is the negative terminal, the anode, collimate the beam, which is, uh, you know, just filter it a little bit, change the opening of the x-ray tube, a detector to gather it all, and a algorithm and computers to reconstruct the images. Here's a picture of a high voltage transformer. That's going to be about uh, 18 to 24 inches from side to side. Weighs about 100 pounds and it's designed, designed to take the voltage that the, the power distribution unit provides to the CT scanner and up that voltage to produce the X-ray. Here's a picture of the X-ray tube itself. Uh, I like it because it shows some cutaways of the different pieces here. The high voltage cable coming in. We've got some cooling. The x-ray tube's gonna be spinning very, very quickly. Uh, the internals, let me go back one more time here. So the, the, the x-ray tube is gonna have a tungsten filament and a, uh, a target. So the tungsten filament takes the high voltage, heats up the tungsten, the tungsten shoots electrons off of it, hits the, uh, the target, and when that and the electrons hit the target, the, the target which is spinning very quickly, then releases X-ray and, and shoots it out of the output window. We can see a little bit of the output window here. And there's the filament. And this is a cutaway here of our target. Our target's gonna be spinning. Uh, fun fact on the GE X-ray tubes, uh, you may be familiar with some of them. They have an MX-165, an MX-200, and an MX-240. That number refers to the diameter of the target in millimeters, 165, 200, or 240 millimeters. 
Siemens and their Stratton tube technology came up with a, a fantastic design. This is this is the uh, going to be the target of a Siemens tube with the filament shooting in the target down on this end. It's an hourglass shape. It's spinning. One of the really cool things is that uh, we are now able to take the oil and it, spin, it goes right across the uh, uh, the target here in a nice shape to really cool the tube. And it allows us to change the focal spot, um, which focal spot, I won't go into too much detail on that. It makes installing a Siemens tube a matter of pressing a button for the machine to adjust the x-ray tube output, where on most of the CT scanners, you're going to have a lot of manual adjustments for aligning. The cathode is the tungsten filament. That's what's shooting out from this end against the target. This is a cutaway of uh, some glass x-ray tubes that really help to demonstrate this. The anode being the tungsten disc, the spinning target here. Um, why are these glowing red? Because they're that hot. Uh, we produce a lot of heat to produce x-ray. This one here is uh, currently in operation. This is making x-ray, if you can see where the laser pointer is and producing just a ton, ton, ton of heat, uh, as you can see. This one has been left to cool, and uh, because this is in the, uh, I actually took this picture at uh, the Varian X-ray tube manufacturer in Salt Lake City, Utah. The, uh, when they're testing this, they don't have a way of really putting the brakes on this spinning. It's in a vacuum. So that we don't have any resistance here, but they literally just have to let it cool off by time and let it spin on the bearing. The bearing being, because this is spinning so quickly, a bearing is one of the things that that wears out. But it is amazing that once you spin up the the target, that it will continue spinning for you know an hour or more uh, if just left alone without the brakes being applied on it. Most modern X-ray tubes also have a large and a small filament. Small filament to produce uh, lower levels of x-ray or doing head scan. Large filament for producing higher amounts of x-ray to do some whole body scanning. Uh, not uncommon that an x-ray tube can fail where either the small filament or the large filament breaks. And uh, the x-ray tube is actually still functional if you choose the large filament but or vice versa. Uh, choose the small filament if the large filament's bad. This is a collimator, so this beam collimation is what uh, controls uh, how much x-ray is coming out of the tube itself. So we're looking at the patient side of the collimator. This is located on the rotating part of the CT. The x-ray tube would be bolted to the opposite side where it shoots the x-ray out. And this is the output window here. It's typically copper. They call it a window. It's not clear glass where you can actually um, I'm sorry, it, it's mylar where you can see through it. The output window of the x-ray tube is gonna be made of metal. It's not something where you can look down into the x-ray tube. We can look down into the collimator. This particular collimator has a semi-opaque uh, output window made out of mylar. You can remove these, these eight screws and take a look inside the collimator and make sure that we've got good lubrication. But they're basically two, two lead plates that move closer or further apart um, to produce a, a slit where the x-ray comes out. So that's where we get the control of our, our fan beam, uh, beam x-ray um, output and uh, also lets us choose slice thickness and, and different things like that when we're acquiring the images themselves. This is an example of uh, a detector module in this picture. So the DAS is what acquires our images. Right here on the end, we have a scintillating crystal. That crystal gets excited when it's exposed to x-ray. Uh, the ex excitation of this crystal is, is sent out an electrical signal, and the rest of this board's job is to process that signal um, through the data acquisition system, turning it into ones and zeros that of course, the computer can understand. When we talked about as, you know, third generation scanners existed with helical possibilities, but one of the big technological developments as well was a uh, detector with crystals. Uh, before that, they used uh, high pressure gas. So we'd have high pressure gas that would be excited by 
the x-ray and that high pressure gas would ionize and the ionization of that gas would be measured to, to get the signal for the, the images that we're producing. Uh, also another big technological development. Um, speaking on the, uh, at least the GE side, we went from uh, a single detector that was not field serviceable to their, on their 64 slice scanner. And this is an example of a module on a 64 slice scanner. If these modules fail, they're user replaceable. Uh, it's a bit of a process and requires a lot of calibration, but it's one way to, to extend the life of the CT scanner uh, designed by the manufacturer to be able to have a field replaceable detector. The reconstruction algorithm, you know, the final bit of the magic that makes our images, the algorithm, as you recall, we were requiring the images in a helix and we have to turn that into parallel slices of anatomy. So it's a pretty fancy bit of math. Uh, I have skipped boring the tears out of you guys with physics. Um, the formula for some of these algorithms uh, just makes your head hurt. My head especially hurts just trying to understand the algorithm. But uh, understand that when we're doing these, these helical acquisitions that the algorithm is, is averaging. Um, so if we, if we have x-ray data and tissue data from the patient, you know, in a row, it averages those three out. But if there's a voxel, and, and think of a voxel as a three-dimensional cube, uh, it's averaging from in the individual space in the image in all different directions in a, in a three-dimensional plane. Um, the algorithm has a lot of, can make a lot of difference on how the images show up. Um, as you know, the reconstruction algorithm is using real data and and interpolated data at the same time. So there are some times that the images just don't show up properly because you've asked to do uh, a, a, a planar, you know, a plane, a reconstruction plane to get a sagittal image, but you don't have enough data there so you can get a lot of artifacts introduced there. And, and we'll see some art artifacts later on. And that's what I talk about with, with the algorithm interpolating. We have our, our analytical and itero iterative uh, algorithms, analytical using actual data coming from the x-ray tube and the DAS, and of course uh, um, the the iterative of where it's inter interpreted, in interpolated, sorry. Uh, this kind of shows you the difference when we go through our slices here. We can see just two slices, translate, rotate. When we go to four angles, our images get a little bit better, and as we, this should be eight, but as we increase our slices, 8, 16, we can start to see that we actually have an image of the brain there. Here's our video of a CT scanner. I'll turn the volume on, hopefully you can hear it. The GE64 slice, and you can see just how much mass is spinning, but I think it's worth kind of seeing how this goes. Mute the volume back on that. Everybody can still hear me. Moving on. All right, come on. There we go. There we go. Now we move into the Hounsfield numbers and the importance of them. So Hounsfield numbers is really just the density of the tissue that we're seeing in a grayscale. Water is zero, air is negative 100, bone is 1,000 more or less. Obviously, there's a little bit of a range. We have some variations there, but this is, Hounsfield is how we see this tissue. Um, it's analyzing each voxel and we'll show it a different way. As you can see, the voxel, when we talked about a three-dimensional cube, this would be an anisotropic voxel because it's not equal, equal distant in the three planes, uh, the pixel just being the side of it, but then you get an idea of the sectional anatomy. So the algorithm is averaging in all different directions what kind of radiation is they're seeing from the voxel for the density of the tissue. There's our anisotropic versus our isotropic voxel. And now you can see just the window and leveling, and you can see the window width and the window level by adjusting it. Here, we're seeing a detail on the lungs, but we can also adjust the image and see more detail in the bone around here that is blown out. So we're able to adjust that when we're viewing uh, the images. 
Again, just some more on the Hounsfield units. So it's very important to have these in calibration and adjusted because it's very necessary to be able to see what kind of tissue we're looking at. We've all seen the, the phantoms here and the phantom, phantoms are really calibrating to these Hounsfield numbers. Water for zero, they use this polycarbonate to uh, 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 approximate bone. And you can also see a diagnostic image where you're scanning the phantom with the internal sections of different densities of acrylic and poly, poly to where we can see where our window and leveling can be so that we're getting the best images out of our machine. Uh, different types of applications we do, pulmonary embolisms are very important. We can see the volume of the lung scans. You can see here everywhere where the arrows are marking off that we're seeing pulmonary embolisms. This is a very important feature of CTs in the ER. We can do strokes. The quick acquisition makes it very good for stroke use. So we can see some of the brain bleeds here on that. And also some different information in the, the 3D reconstructions because of the density differences we see. CT colonoscopy, again, we've got our sectional images of the colon here, some 3D reconstructions of it. And now you can actually see right where the blockage is when it's reconstructed. Biopsies, another very common use. We can see the needle right here, our tumor. This needle, the, the CT is, is working kind of like a live fluoro, so where we can get a three-dimensional view of where that needle is and perform some very accurate biopsies. CT angiography, of course, very important as well, seeing the blood vessels. Usually requires injection of some contrast, but you can see what kind of images we get there. Common problems in the cost of ownership from a maintenance perspective, uh, we've, we've got image artifacts, maintenance, and just the real cost. We're getting close to the end here, so thanks everybody for holding on here. I think we might go a few minutes over, but uh, we are getting coming close to the end. Lots of data here, streak artifacts, you're gonna see these uh, all around bone or metal. Um, there are a lot of different processing algorithms to compensate for our image artifacts now. Uh, talk about a little bit of the troubleshooting. Cleaning contrast, contrast gets filled. Uh, you know, sometimes power supplies start introducing a little bit of noise and when, and if it's near that data acquisition system on the detector, you know, any, any, any power fluctuations in the power supply will show up in the images. Here's some examples of some, uh, we're, we're seeing a ring here as well, but really wanted to show because this is just a blatant streak artifacts, these lines going across. This is a phantom image. This actually is a fairly normal image. We have screws in the phantom holding it together at these points, and you can see what those screws do. So if a patient has a metal implant, we're gonna see that sort of thing as well. Partial volume effect, blurring of the edges. This is when the x-ray, again, when, when we're doing the algorithm and it sees high density material right next to low density material, and the algorithm averages high density and low density. So it, thinks that there is a smooth transition rather than a hard transition. Um, and you can see that as the shadow around the human brain and this section here and some of the shadowing here. So we have a, a very different density there that uh, the scanner um, just averages it together. Increasing your amount of slices, of course, improves that image quality or doing an isotropic acquisition, that's where we keep our voxels all equidistant so that the we get a little better averaging uh, from the x-ray of what we're seeing, better sample size, better image quality. Ring artifacts we saw a little bit. Um, this is often pointing to hardware. Again, always look for contrast and cleaning, but uh, we're gonna be looking heavily on the detector at this point. Here's some examples of rings here. We've got a partial ring here shown up on the phantom. See, we've used uh, two different window and leveling to kind of see where that that uh, ring is showing up. Uh, and these here are going to be this here on the Phillips uh, was a uh, um, contrast issue. This here on a GE scanner that was uh, requiring a detector module replacement that we saw before. Here's a bullseye variation uh, of that. We can see that we've got a lot of concentric circles on the phantom. That can be multiple hardware failures, but when you see rings just bullseye all the way across, typically means we're just very, very much out of calibration or calibration was done improperly. 
noise uh, caused by a low signal to noise ratio um, happens when we use a thin slice because when we have a thin slice, we don't have as much x ray. These are often x ray starved images. Um, you can see what it looks like with the just lack of data streaking across there on the, on the image. Um, noise can be corrected by increasing the x-ray output a little bit, uh, changing your acquisition. Um, windmill, again, this is, a, this is a technologist error where you can adjust, you've got to adjust your acquisition technique or uh, apply some software filters, but the, the reconstruction plane from the algorithm and the detector, um, you know, when they intersect, you get some really crazy things like this popping up. Beam hardening, a little bit more of a, a obscure, hard to wrap your head around uh, artifact. Notice the arrows pointing into it's this little band right here. And I just use the, the Wikipedia words here for explaining it uh, because it is a, a little bit difficult to uh, wrap your head around. But um, um, it talks about just the attenuation of the, the X-ray or the photons in the X-ray itself. and um, um, needing to do the proper acquisition to correct that. <clears throat> Getting an image artifact on a machine is typically the key. And just some fun pictures here of uh, a jar of dill pickles it will will uh, approximate the brain very well. The Hounsfield numbers of the glass are similar to bone, and the pickle is similar to brain. And an old old technique would be, um, I lost my pointer it looks like, would be just using a, a good old-fashioned turkey. We've got some uh, frozen turkey here that we can scan and, and see if we can get some of these artifacts to reproduce. Maintenance is key on, uh, on imaging equipment, especially CTs, just like anything. The, the better maintained, the better it is. You want to get the x-ray tube to last as long as possible. X-ray tubes uh, can run anywhere from as, as low as uh, 25 to 30,000 for a, a decent x a used x-ray tube to uh, uh, $230,000 or more. Uh, when we talked about that Siemens scanner that had two x-ray tubes, yes, it does have two $230,000 x-ray tubes on there. So a half a million dollars worth of x-ray tubes spinning around. As you can imagine, very expensive to uh, replace those when needed. And x-ray tubes are, they're kind of like light, uh, light bulbs because of the filaments. We, we can't predict with perfect accuracy of when they will fail, but keeping them cool, keeping them well-maintained will extend x-ray tube life. But ultimately, it, it comes down to use. If your scanner is used a, a lot, you're going to need more x-ray tubes than a scanner that is used uh, less. Uh, always want to check the flow of the coolant that's going to the tube on an open system like a GE. You can check that flow rate. Uh, you want to make sure that your cooling pumps are working and the heat exchangers are clean and clear. Um, and just good good observational stuff. Environmentals are, are highly important as well. Any image equipment, not just CT. They need 480 volts, not 447 volts. That's a problem when you're running low voltage. As your voltage goes down, your your amperage goes up. You'll start blowing things. Your I'm sorry, uh, current goes up. You'll blow things up. I've seen some crazy things in my time in the field. As the HVAC broke, but uh, in the neighboring room, the HVAC worked. So they used a dryer vent to try to pump that HVAC into the scan room. Um, keep your environmentals in spec. Keep your HVAC working, and do not. Uh, you know, you, you've got to sometimes put your foot down when you're doing this service and say, you can't scan until the HVAC is repaired. Uh, as you can see here, this scan room got so hot that the computer itself began to melt. You can also see what dirt will do. You can see this cooling fan wasn't working. Um, this was uh, a lot of neglect for not maintaining the computers, which are so important for all of that reconstruction. Also gonna have filters on air-cooled gantries. Slip rings and the brushes, we've got to replace the brushes regularly. We've got to vacuum these slip rings and keep them clean. We want to make sure they're clean so that we don't get pitting. As you can imagine, these are these are buried into the scanner a little bit. They're a high dollar part and uh, time consuming to replace. Mylar windows, keep them clean when they start getting cracked and uncleanable. 
they are a replacement part, and that's where the x-ray shoots in through the edges. Um, take the tabletop off. That's the part that moves in and out right on top. Take it off. You'll find debris under there, contrast, needle caps, you name it. Um, and run your diagnostics. Take a look at your images. And it's important to know what your phantom image is and what, what you would expect out of the uh, scanner when it's working, you know, so that you can recognize better what's happening when it's not working. Notice this scanner, we've got good image quality as noted by the readings there and great voltage, 479, we're only one volt off. But the real costs with the scanner, I mean, there's a lot of different things you've got to figure in to own one. Um, they do need to be regular, regularly maintained, no less than four times a year quarterly. Uh, I would recommend if you're in an ER uh, where the scanner is running 24-7, 365, that you try to get in there and do PMs more often, even if you can just get in and vacuum some of the dust out. Uh, there's a lot of parts available in the market. You can buy uh, ISO parts like Avanti offers that are refurbished uh, or purchased from the OEM. Uh, third parties can oftentimes uh, um, provide the parts uh, at a significant cost cost savings, if not a crazy cost savings. Um, but there's also some things that, you know, brushes, you don't buy used brushes, you buy new brushes. And that's why we provide new brushes where, where needed. Uh, don't like to sell uh, a wear part necessarily, a part that's, you know, due to wear out used. Um, and also knowing how to service it, training. Uh, a lot of Biomedical engineers, I know, are, are a little bit trepidatious as far as jumping in on on the uh, the big heavy metal machines like the CT or the MRI. But a little bit of training, you know, a, a couple of weeks of training that that provided either at Avanti or other sources around or in house or simply buddying up with uh, an engineer that that is already working on it can get you a, a much better comfort level because a lot of it is you know cleaning and calibration for. Um, training uh, to to work with it and and uh, just working side by side with somebody great uh, is uh, can teach you a lot. Service needs uh, it's really something you should you should take a look at with what your facility needs. Um, there's everything from you know 24 hour a day full service contracts where everything is covered to you know a a support relationship where somebody is there to help your in-house staff service the equipment, um, or just a PM only contract or a, a, a shared agreement. Uh, obviously, the more coverage you, you purchase, the more expensive it is, the less coverage. You'll save money, but you're taking on more risk on this. Some people just prefer to have x-ray tube coverage. Other people want everything covered but the x-ray tube. Um, but, but analyzing what your site needs is important. And, and and knowing, you know, we, we have some sites that are, you know, as a service provider, they've said, fix the scanner at, at, at all costs. I don't care what it's going to take. Overtime approved. And uh, it seems silly sometimes to, um, you know, work all night, have a large over overtime bill to get a scanner up when the facility maybe has two or three CT scanners already and two of them are functioning and aren't used overnight. So, Paying attention to that and, and, and seeing some of these places where you could make some recommendations to the decision makers and radiology as far as getting a good solution for service on your scanner. But the most important thing is to provide that, that maintenance regularly, on time, and proficiently, and encompassing everything that needs to be done, um, and balancing that with, of course, you know, what, what does the facility need? But uh, ignoring these scanners is just a recipe for disaster. They failures can be very expensive. You know, we have two hundred thousand dollar X-ray tubes out there all of the time. You know, slip ring replacement can be twenty to thirty thousand dollars on up. Um, high voltage components are, are typically five figures, low five figures to replace those. And, and there's a lot of things that are preventable. Slip rings, if they're well maintained, really should never require to be require replacement. Um, slip rings need to be about the 20 year age mark before they just wear out from use. And that's uncommon to have 20 year old scanners in the market. X-ray tubes are gonna be regular items and, and you need to, to plan for that. How much usage do we see in that facility? If we're looking to make a change to our, 
how we've serviced things in the past, most all of these scanners record their tube history, how many tubes have been installed. And you can, you can see that on average, we replace an x-ray tube every year. How much is the tube? Uh, okay, we need to budget at least that amount because that's what we're going to spend on an x-ray tube every year. So when I say it's not a, you know, and when I say a tube's going to last a year, you might have one that lasts a year and three months and one that lasts nine, nine months. That's an average of a tube a year. Um, lots, of, lots of things there to consider, but just making sure that the machine gets maintained. That was an incredible amount of information. I thank you guys for, uh, for thank everyone for sticking with us on that. But uh, I'm happy to take some questions now. Thank you so much, uh, Eric. That was really, really good. Um, we've got time for a couple of very quick questions. Um, how dangerous is the x-ray used in a CT exam? Uh, it's not terribly dangerous. If you just have an x-ray done, you know, when your doctor requires it uh, and it's done properly, it's not that dangerous. We always want to, as, as a service personnel, you want to make sure that you're never exposed to it because you're in front of them every, uh, in front of them every day. But if you've had uh, one or two CT scans in your life, um, no issues as far as the radiation dose. It really is a cumulative effect over your lifetime. So you want to wait as long as possible to have your CT. So hopefully you only get them when you're older and only have them when absolutely necessary. That's great. Thank you. Um, we've got time for one more. Um, how will CT be utilized in the future? CT, they're continually coming up with new ways to use CT. The 3D reconstructions have been used uh, for surgical planning. I think that's only going to expand. I think that there's going to be a lot more utilization. We're seeing this a little bit on the research side of where CTs are being used concurrently with live operations to where uh, there's a CT scanner in the operating room where the patient's moved into the scanner and out. I think we're going to see a lot more automation in medical procedures, and I think CT scanners are going to be a key to that. That's great. Well, we're coming up to our hour. So uh, thank you, Eric, for a really great and informative webinar. And I'm sure everybody would agree with me. And thank you again to today's sponsor, Avante Health Solutions. Just a reminder that the post-webinar survey and certificate process is now automated. So the survey link will be included in the follow-up email, which you'll receive in about an hour's time. Once you've completed the survey, you'll be able to download your certificate immediately. And one lucky attendee will win an Amazon gift card for completing the survey. If you have any questions, please contact us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. For more information about our upcoming webinars, please visit our website, webinarwednesday.live. So thank you once again for joining us today. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you next time. All right, and I wanted to thank you again as well. My contact information is up on the screen, and I welcome phone calls and emails, any follow-up questions, anything you guys would like to talk about. I I truly love the industry and love talking about it. So would would happy to be in contact with anybody. Thank you. And thank you, Linda, MD Publishing and Tech Nation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric.